Hi, I'm Sarah and I'm a senior at University of Kentucky in biology and I'm here to talk to you about a lab on quantal synaptic transmission. Um, so synaptic transmission occurs when an action potential travels down the neuron and when it gets to the end of the neuron there are um, calcium channels that open and then they cause the vesicle which is just like a sphere filled, filled with chemicals that we call neurotransmitters and this um, sphere um, it fuses to the membrane and then it can be the chemicals can be released out into the synaptic cleft. So once the neurotransmitter diffuses across the synapse, um, it goes to the postsynaptic membrane, which is usually a target cell, and it could be either a neuron or some other target, maybe a muscle even. Um, and then depending on the receptors, it could be excitatory, which would cause depolarization, or inhibitory, which would cause hyperpolarization. So there are a couple different ways that we can measure this response and one way would be with an intracellular electrode to measure the depolarizations and hyperpolarizations or like we're planning to use a focal electrode and um, let's say if my hand was a muscle cell and my ring is the nerve terminal and then my hand is the focal electrode um, with a lumen of about 10 microns then you come over, right over the nerve terminal to record, but if you're off of it, then you're not gonna get a recording. Um, this method is really similar to what Sir Bernard Katz used in the 1950s, and he took a focal electrode um, and tried to find the neuromuscular junction and then whenever he was actually over the neuromuscular junction he actually saw the recordings so this is pretty similar to that method. So if we use our focal electrode and we're over the nerve terminal um, we might get without stimulation just some spontaneous events and we call these minis because when we're actually stimulating we get a larger evoked response and this evoked response is actually made up of multiples of the little minis. So we need to measure the unitary increments of the evoked response. So when Bernard Katz was performing his experiments, he noticed that the evoked amplitude um, that the minis would add up to form one of the evoked, um, and that if there was one evoked, sometimes it would be the same as the mini. So this helped him come up with the quantal hypothesis, which basically he just thought that um, it was released in packets, and that one packet would be the amount of chemical or neurotransmitter release. And it wasn't until several years later that they actually found anatomically that there were vesicles present, so this really validated Bernard Katz's experiments physiologically with the quantal hypothesis. So now the problem is how to index the response of these quanta, and the problem is that one time you might have one vesicle released and then one right after, so you would really get an amplitude like this, but then if you have one and then it starts to come back down and one released slightly after, then it's like two bumps in the amplitude almost, so amplitude not isn't necessarily an accurate measure of the index of the quantal response. So now in this lab we're going to be trying to figure out what the best method for measuring these responses is. So for our prep we're going to be using the crayfish neuromuscular junction which actually Bernard Katz used before he switched to his famous work with the frog neuromuscular junction and the advantage with the crayfish is that we get a graded response so this is advantageous because we don't have um, the depolarizations occurring, causing an action potential, but with the frog it's really a problem because we have to keep it sub-threshold so we don't see these action potentials. Um, the crayfish is also advantageous because we get to look at phasic and tonic um, neurons at the same time in the neuromuscular junction. The difference between these two types of neurons is that the tonic are known as slow 
and this is when um, a few of the vesicles might fuse at one time so they don't fatigue mm -hmm. and with stimulation they might continue to build up until they plateau but the phasic are fast and the vesicles fuse all at once kind of it's a lot um, and then they at the beginning have a big response but then over time it decreases and they start to fatigue. So now that you've recorded, we could use a fluorescent microscope and a vital dye, which means that our prep will still be living, um, to visualize the differences between these phasic and tonic neurons. And you can visualize the actual nerve terminal. The phasic neurons have thin nerve terminals that are called filiforms. And then the tonic neurons, you'll actually be able to see swellings that are called varicoses, and they kind of come and go like sausage links in um, how they're swelling and then a little thinner and then swelling again. But you'll really be able to visualize it with the vital dye. You might even be able to visualize this with methylene blue, but the problem is it doesn't always last that long, but if we keep our saline cold enough, it might last long enough for us to visualize with methylene blue. So the first method that we could use for indexing these quantal responses is called the direct count method, and basically we just go through and count the responses, and the problem with this is we could see maybe one where two vesicles fuse, so we have a big amplitude, but we might accidentally count that as one response. But whereas um, if it was a little bit slower, two vesicle fusing, we might have like one response here and then a bump. So we have to be careful with how we count this. But um, once we go through and count the number of failures versus responses, um, one time, two time, three times, etc., we can go through and perform statistical analysis on it to see if it's um, a binomial distribution, a normal distribution, or a Poisson distribution, which basically just means it's random. Another method that we can use is measuring the pink amplitude of these events, and um, this is where we just measure from the base to the very top of the amplitude, and this is usually a pretty good method except when we might see those delays again because it might come up and then dip down and then come back up and dip down and maybe even go up again. But this can cause a little bit of an error versus if we were just measuring one response where it was from the base to the peak. So to measure the evoked responses, we could stimulate, say, at one hertz and go through and see if we have failures or we might have one or two or three and we just take the average of all of these for our evoked events. But then we also want to measure our spontaneous events so we could stimulate and then see how many we get, maybe 50. We also want to measure our spontaneous events or our minis which measure one ves vesicle release and to do this, we might do it between stimulation or just under no stimulation. And we count how many we have, and then we can take that number and divide it into, um, well, we take that average, and then we divide that into the average from the evoked. And then that gives us a good measure of, and that method is what we call mean quantal content. Um, our third method is using the area under the peak and we could even use our same recording if we still have it on our computer or a new recording, whichever. And um, basically you just go through and you find one of your evoked responses and then you determine where it starts and where it stops 
and then you measure the area under the curve, which um, this helps if we have an amplitude that comes up and then goes back down and then comes back up, or if we just have it going up and down, that way we're getting the whole area under the peak. And so we're gonna take our average of all the areas for the evoked responses, and we wanna do the same thing with the minis. Um, so we would go through and find one of our spontaneous events and then determine where it starts and stops and measure under the peak. And then we do that for all of them and take the average and then we'll still take the average of the minis and divide it in with the evoked and then that way we still get the mean quantal content we're just using a different method with the area under the peak. So now we can compare between these three methods to determine the accuracy of these methods and maybe why some are more accurate than others, but we can also look at which methods are more useful for phasic versus tonic neurons. So it's really advantageous that we have these three different methods to use and compare between. So indexing the quantal response is really important because we want to know if we have a pharmacological agent, how it might interact with different um, synaptic release of vesicles or even we could use it for disease pathology and we might use it in a mouse model or in Drosophila but some of these diseases can mimic our diseases so it's really important to understand the quantal response. So you might be wondering why we have variation in the size of these quantal responses and we could have some differences in either the presynaptic or the postsynaptic membrane. Um, regarding the postsynaptic membrane, we could have our focal electrode over an area that is um, that has several synapses, and each synapse could be different. So that could really contribute to our variability. Um, each synapse could have a different dens uh, density of receptors. So we could have some with a uh, high density of receptors versus some with low. It could also depend on where the vesicle fuses because it, it could be fusing right in the middle so it could be activating all these receptors versus if it fused over to the side a little more then we might only be activating some of the receptors. Um, another postsynaptic difference could come from the types of receptors that are present and in our prep we have um, excitatory um, ionotropic um, receptors which actually are ion channels once glutamate comes and fuses with the um, receptor and then it opens up the ion channel. But these other types of receptors that could be present are called metabotropic receptors and these actually aren't ion channels but they could go and activate second messenger systems which could potentially cause a lot of variation. So we can also have variation due to the at the presynaptic membrane of the synapse and this could be caused by maybe the size of the vesicle. We might have bigger versus smaller vesicles um, or it could even be due to um, repackaging of the vesicles. So we might have one vesicle that's not repackaging and it might have more neurotransmitter or uh, if there's one that's in the process of repackaging, it might not release as much neurotransmitter. Um, another difference that could come up is in the fusion of the vesicles, which we might have some vesicles that come to the membrane and do full exocytosis versus some come and do kiss and run, and they might not be open for as long, so it's a different level of exocytosis, which could contribute to variation. 